Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It is my pleasure to be home in Alameda County, um, and I'm very pleased to be at this morning meeting. I th can't think of a more important place for you to be. The truth is that uh, I want to talk to you about what we really need in this community and in this state, in this country, and that is courage, vision, and heart. Because the truth is, we have more resources than our ancestors had coming out of a depression and a war. But we're not doing as well by our children, I would argue, as those people did in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and into the 70s. And I also want to say that I think it's really important that we figure out how we work together. Cities and schools, nonprofits and community-based organizations, parents and grandparents, and great-grandparents. I think it's important that we get everybody in this game with us to talk about how, in fact, we nurture our children and how we send the message that we understand what Neil Postman said when he said, children are a message we send to a time we will never see. The truth is that I grew up in a California where there were great Republican governors and great Democratic governors. And I want to give a shout out to Earl Warren and Pat Brown. Because the truth is, in those days, people found a way to work across the aisle. They found a way to focus on what was good for children. And I think that we have an opportunity in this community to work across the aisle and uh, between the cities and the schools and between other organizations to focus on what's best for our children. And I think that's what we really do need to do today. Now let me just say I salute all of you because I realize more than ever that our children really need heroes. They need angels. But I've come to a realization that the heroes and the angels in my own life look a lot like Mr. Ro more like Mr. Rogers than like John Wayne. They look a lot more like Betty White or Barbara Jordan than they look like Miss America. The fact is that real heroes and real leaders look like the people sitting in this room on Saturday morning. And I want to just say that I believe very strongly that our children need you now more than ever. There, is, there are so many challenges in California, and so many children are in very difficult circumstances. They have single parents, or they have two parents that are working two jobs each. They have parents that are commuting long distances, and, and these parents love their kids, but in fact, they are unable to give them the time they really wish they could. They may be in foster care or in a group home. They may be being raised by a grandmother. I have met these people as I visited schools all across California. And in fact, I've been in schools in both San Leandro and San Lorenzo, and I've been in schools in every school in Union City, every school, in, uh, I've been to at least one school in every county in the state of California. And I'll tell you something, there's nothing wrong with our children. I'm worried about some of the grown-ups, <laughs> the kids, whether they're in rural, remote parts of the state or whether they're here in San Leandro, these kids are just fine. That, but they do need the kind of support that the people in this room can lend them. And that you can identify uh, other people who may not be here this morning and can help us to be role models for these children. I've, <clears throat> it's spring, so you're probably not thinking of It's a Wonderful Life, my favorite Christmas movie. And I, but I just want to remind you all, there's a wonderful scene in It's a Wonderful Life where Jimmy Stewart, who plays George Bailey, is thinking about killing himself. He's going to jump in the river and drown so his family will get his life insurance policy. And there, his angel, his angel apprentice, George Clarence Oddbody, uh, played by a wonderful uh, character actor named Henry Travers, <clears throat> Clarence realizes he'll never get his angel wings if George commits suicide. And so Clarence does an amazing thing. He jumps in the river knowing George will jump in to save him. And afterward, they're sitting by the pot-bellied stove, warming up, and <clears throat> George asks Clarence, why were you trying to kill yourself? And he says, oh, I really wasn't trying to kill myself. I was trying to save you. He said, what are you talking about? I, he said, I, I jumped in the river so you'd jump in to save me and wouldn't jump in yourself. I'm your guardian angel. I'm here to help you. George thinks for a minute, and he says, you look like the kind of guardian angel I get. <laughs> the truth is, a lot of us in this room have had a guardian angel or two. And it might be your grandmother or your aunt or your uncle. 
It might be the neighbor across the street or down the block. It might be any one of a dozen people who um, you could recognize and you could tell me about. But the fact is that <clears throat> in this world, we have to make sure that we are reaching out to children constantly because we never know what challenges they're facing. And I will say for the benefit of everyone here, a lot of us who grew up in pretty normal looking houses had a story going on. And I didn't talk about this much when I was running for Union City City Council because my parents were still alive. But I talk about it now all the time. Because I think there are some people who, I know some of you did not grow up in dysfunctional families. But you married somebody who grew up in a dysfunctional family. <laughs> or your best friend was from a dysfunctional family. I'm a triple dipper. <laughs> what, what the research tells us about kids that grow up in dysfunctional families is that over 70% of them become functional adults. And you know what they have in common? They got more education than their parents got, and they had a mentor other than a parent, commonly a teacher, but it might be a recreation leader. It might be an after-school tutor. It might be, as I said, some neighbor, some friend, some member of the community, somebody sitting in this room this morning. I will just tell you that I believe it's time for this community and every other community in California to figure out how we put down the barriers, get out of the silo, and work together on behalf of the people that live in our town, most especially our children. And I will tell you all. Constitution of the state of California has this wonderful preamble where they talk about, you know, secure the blessings of liberty, provide for the common defense, all that good stuff. But remember who they say it's for? For ourselves and our posterity. Our posterity is the only interest group important enough to be mentioned in the preamble to the Constitution. And I think it ought to be a laser focus of people that live in this state, in this county, and in this town. The reality is that, that focusing on children pe pays huge dividends. And I'll give you an example. Ruth and I came out of Union City. Ruth and her wonderful family were great supporters of mine. Her kids were two and four and being pushed in, wheel in little wheeled vehicles, but that's okay. The reality is that when we were in Union City, there was a really serious gang problem in the city. It was the fastest growing community in Alameda County and we couldn't hardly build the schools and, and maintain them, let alone the city parks and maintain them. And so we did some things cooperatively. I proposed to the mayor that we put together a committee made up of two members, the mayor and a member of the council, me, and the city manager, and a, the head of the school board and the secretary of the school board and the city uh, superintendent, school superintendent. And we started meeting on a regular basis and began to talk about things we could do. They built schools on city parks and co-maintained them. Stop and think about it. In a lot of, now you're not a fast growing city, so this may be not a real issue, but stop and think about it. During the school day, most of the parks are empty and the schools are full. Then summer comes and the schools empty out and the parks are full. But we figured out that if we cooperated, maintained these things together, that we could get a lot more done. And we had freed up money that would have gone to maintenance for such things as recreational programs for the city and for uh, more education for the kids. We then had this big fight on the council about whether or not we should help the school district put a police officer at James Logan High School. This was controversial because most districts are expected to pay for their own police, thank you very much. Schools will tell you, <coughs> I mean cities will tell you, schools have bigger budgets typically than, school, than cities do. And so there's sometimes a resentment about sharing costs for things. Well, we decided since we had a huge problem in Union City, a lot of kids not coming to school. Kids that don't come to school are the ones who drop out. Kids who don't come to school are the ones because they fell behind. They're also more likely to be, you know, becoming young parents. And uh, they're also more likely to just be getting into trouble. So we had this big argument between the members of the council, and on a three to two vote, we agreed to pay half the cost of putting an actual officer at James Logan High School. But we told the chief of police, and Mike Manick is still one of my heroes, studied to be a priest, a very special chief of police, cop, <laughs> and he said to us, he believed we should put a young officer 
and we should focus on attendance, which was what he, we wanted him to do. And he could do that. And so you know what happened in Union City, California because of that? Well, the people here from schools know that we don't pay you if the kid doesn't show up. California has one of the strictest rules of non-payment for non-attendance of any state in the union. So if a kid is out of school more than uh, four periods, essentially, they don't get any money, or less than, if they're in school less than four periods, or if they're out more than four, we don't send the city, the school district any money. And so by focusing on attendance, and oh, by the way, it has a different effect when Mrs. McGillicuddy, the attendance clerk calls the house, or Officer Krupke calls the house. It just has a different effect. I don't know what that is exactly, but I, I think you're getting the, uh, the gist of it. So we had the officer focus on attendance. Guess what happened? Attendance shot up. What does that mean for New Haven Unified? They got hundreds of thousands more dollars that year. What did that mean for the kids in New Haven? Graduation rates went up. Dropout rates went down. Oh, and by the way, the daytime crime rate in Union City dropped 33%. It was a win, win, win. Within four years, we had data that showed that we were one of the top 10 feeder schools to the University of California at Berkeley for affirmative action. We had, and they don't track that number anymore, but the truth was we went from being, you know, sort of dropout gang city to being a place where kids got engaged. We, we helped the school district to pass bonds, and at one time we had the highest percentage of bond indebtedness for the schools of any community around. And you know what? The schools in Union City got better. We said the old schools should look like the new schools. And, and we, I, I chaired the facilities task force, even though I was on the city council, or I was actually on the planning commission at that time. But, but still, if you get everybody in the town in the game, it pays amazing dividends in terms of public safety, in terms of community commitment, in terms of student engagement. And I will just tell you, the more you can get the kids engaged in, in doing things in the community, the better they feel about themselves. Look, the Greeks cement invented the word democracy. It comes from two Greek words, demos and kratos, government by the people. But the Greeks believed that more important than the political system you got when you got people to participate was the outcome for the individual. That it personally changed people to perform. And whether it was theater or music or some other kind of public performance or actively engaging in politics, it caused people to grow. I think some of you who I've known over the years know that if you get involved, it changes you. First, you meet some of the nicest people. And second, you really do feel better about who you are and what you do. Well, that's true for kids, too. So finding ways to engage our kids in the community is really important in terms of where we go from here on. Now, I'll just tell you that <clears throat> for children that go home to a house that's in chaos or disorder, what happens the rest of the day really makes a bigger difference than you can ever know. That somehow when you go into a house where there's alcohol or drugs or mental illness or some other kind of a challenge, you do in fact know that if the kids have had wonderful grounding during the day, if they've got things to look forward to, whether it's at school or on the weekend, if there are teams and, and opportunities for them to participate in a variety of ways, they can get through some of the chaos. When he was asked how he survived the Holocaust, Viktor Frankl quoted Nietzsche, he who has a why to live can bear with almost any how. Somehow we have to do a better job in our communities of giving kids the why. Why do we want them to go to school? Why do we want them to not break into our cars in the BART parking lot? Why do we want them to help out each other? Why do we want them to be kind and gentle to those children who have special needs? Why, in fact, do we want them to complete their homework and or to participate? Oh, thank you. I'm always a court low. <laughs> I'm always a court low in the spring. <laughs> but the truth is that great civilizations inspire great personal achievement and great social responsibility. Great civilizations arise from the imagination and hard work of people who are nurtured by their societies to develop their gifts. In a word, education. Education is the place where personal and social responsibility come together for personal and social greatness, both together. 
But education doesn't just happen at school. Education happens all day, every day, by the adults in the community and by the older children helping the younger children, by everybody taking responsibility for knowing they are a role model. So we must ensure that our schools and our communities are not only the repository of past success, but really laboratories for the future adventures of our time. We've got to give kids a sense of meaning and purpose in what we're doing, whether it's at school or in the park, whether they're walking down the street or going to BART, whether they're helping each other or some other person out. We've got to create in our students this sense of social responsibility. We've also got to make sure that the fact is that we're talking about the future greatness of this community, but we're talking about the future greatness of each and every individual child. And when we say that, we must say to each student, we need you. There are talents in you you may not know about yet, but we need you. We have good and important work for you to do. And we must tell our students that it is, in fact, true that great arises out of working hard, yes, but also out of finding things that you love to do that are constructive. You know, George Bernard Shaw said, if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. I don't know about you, but I've known a whole lot of wonderful recreation leaders and teachers, a lot of wonderful principals and a lot of wonderful city managers and a lot of staff and, yes, a lot of people who don't necessarily make the big money, but who feel real satisfaction about what they do. I've known some fantastic police officers and firefighters Got some of all those people in my family. Got some nurses and even a few doctors, but some engineers, but also some people that work with their hands. My brother, the plumber. My dad, the machinist. So we've got to say to kids that all work has dignity in it. All work is important. I'm glad career and technical education is here today. The truth is, I was once in the Silicon Valley debating Milton Friedman. <laughs> it was during the voucher fight. and. We debated a little bit, and some guy got up in the audience, and he said, look, I can't be worried. We were debating the voucher at the time, and it was on the ballot, and he said, I can't be worried about other people's children. I can only worry about my child. What are you going to, why don't you just let me take care of my child? I said, well, let me talk to you about that. Do you fly? <clears throat> because when you get on that airplane, somebody else's child is the pilot. Somebody else is the machinist to machine the parts in that wing assembly when it lifts up so gloriously and sets you and your family safely down. Somebody else's child took the engine off that wing and overhauled it and remounted it. Somebody else's child is in the air traffic control tower seeing you and your family safely home. This country runs on other people's children. And we must never forget. And I want to also say that there are those who say that the government has no role in, you know, all this stuff that you hear about people who apparently haven't read any history. So I want to just remind you that the founders of the first two political parties, that would be Jefferson and Adams, Jefferson wrote, every government degenerates when trusted to the rulers of the people alone. The people themselves are the only safe depositories. To render even them safe, their minds must be improved to a certain degree. An amendment to our Constitution must here come in aid of public education. Mm -hmm. That from the biggest advocate of states' rights in the history of our country. His opponent, not to be outdone, John Adams wrote, laws for the liberal education of youth are so extremely wise and useful that to a humane and generous mind, no expense for this purpose should be thought extravagant, end quote. These two people, who were enemies, actually, in the early years of the country, went on to become great friends again. And they each died, by the way, July 4th, 1826, exactly 50 years to the day after the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Adam's last words were, Jefferson lives. But we all live. We all live here now, and we can all make a difference. We can all contribute. We can all look in these eyes of these children and say, wow, what can we do? What can we do to make sure that our kids have a great education? Now, I'll, I'll say just for now, I'm very, very disappointed in this governor and in the previous governor. 
So I want to be sure I'm bipartisan here. <laughs> For several years, we have not been focusing on children in the way we should. <clears throat> Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn what your, what your politics are. The truth is, we must go back to focusing on the children of this state. And I will tell you that when I graduated high school, my parents, the machinist and the sales clerk, had, my dad had been in the Second World War, He'd been actually 20 years in the United States Navy, 22 years. He was a machinist, my mother was a dress clerk. And when the time came for me to go to college, they wanted a new car. They had a 55 Studebaker. It was 1965. They stopped making in Studebakers in 1960. So my dad was afraid they couldn't get parts for it. <coughs> my mother <coughs> wanted a new couch. My brother and I had thought about the career in the circus, and we had trampolined the old cat. <laughs> we did not go to the circus, however. And my mother did want a new couch, since she was due. Uh, the, you had to be careful where you sat, you know. Uh, so my dad wanted to go to Kentucky, and, and the fact was his mother had passed away a few years before, and it was the first reunion since his mother had passed. And they wanted to send their daughter, me, to college. And this is what I think is important here. Budgets are statement of values. So you know what my parents did. They didn't buy a car. They didn't buy a couch. They didn't go to Kentucky. They sent their daughter to college. And so in fact, we have to get the state of California to begin to treat our children like it's the most important thing we do. The Constitution of the state of California says that even before the payment of debt, we are to educate the children. So I am shocked. It's a beautiful spring, but it's giving me, you know, the worst allergies. I am, I am shocked to stand here tonight, to this morning and tell you we are 47th of the 50 states in per pupil spending, but we are number one in per prisoner expenditure. Let that settle in for just a minute. And then show me the hands of all the people who think that's a good plan. I'm looking for these people. I have been talking around California. I haven't found a single person that thinks we ought to be, I'm sorry, I know you're trying to come up. I, I haven't found a single person that thinks it's, it's acceptable or even a slightly good idea to be 47th in per pupil spending and first in per prisoner. The reality is that the state constitution which says we should be spending, our first priority should be education, if they looked over the last few years, they'd find the budget of California went up 30%, so you'd think education number one priority would have gone up more than that, right? No, no. Education went up less than 20%. Prisons went up 77%, and bonded indebtedness went up 111%. Everyone in this room needs to begin to say to our elected figures, we have to put the children first. Don't get rid of the Studebaker. Don't buy the high-speed rail until you've educated the children. We're wrecking higher education where we're hurting K-12, and now the governor has proposed to take child development out of the Department of Education and give it to county welfare offices. The truth is he's proposed to knock 62,000 under five-year-old children off of, the, off of uh, receiving child development money at all, altogether and so then the single mother, and 33% of these 62,000 kids have single mothers. Now the single mother has to decide, well, will I go to work and leave my child in a latchkey situation under five? Or find just anybody to take care of them? Or do I quit my job? This is not good public policy. And George Duke Major knew it wasn't good public policy. Why does Jerry Brown think it's good public policy? This is the Department of Finance's plan, has been for years. The Department of Finance, you should know this about them, they know the cost of everything and the value of nothing. <laughs> and so the truth is that we all have to figure, we have to figure out what, it, what, what we do to be George Bailey, to be the average person who steps up and says, all right, we've got to save these children. And some of them are not, you know, um, on many levels, we are not helping our kids. In, in France, preschool is universally available. It's for all kids. In fact, when a French mother gets pregnant, the doctor notifies the French government so that her stipend can begin to come, and so they can make sure she sees a doctor regularly. 
When she has the baby, she has a nine months paid leave. In many European countries, it's three years. They pay women to work only part time after three years in some countries so that there'll be more time with their kids. The fact is that in many countries, they really do put their children first. You know how many countries don't have paid maternity leave? That would be four. I think you can name one, the United States. You know the other three? Swaziland, Papua New Guinea, and Liberia. How you like hanging with that crowd? <laughs> if you really thought you were pro-child, you would be for maternity leave that was paid. And in the end of the day, we all have to be thinking about what we do to support our children. Look, we have an obesity crisis among our children in this country, far worse than it is in most other countries. And I want to stipulate, I'm overweight. I'm 64, though. I wasn't as a kid. I, I, I would be in so much worse trouble if I started out overweight. And for children, it's, it, it dramatically increases our costs in the long term, not to do child development, not to do children's health, not to do uh, good healthy lunches, not to promote healthy activities. It actually increases our cost because the dramatic rise in type 2 diabetes, it's contributing to hypertension, it's contributing to sleep apnea, it's contributing to a host of other problems. But we don't have a coordinated approach to children's health, and that's a place where city and schools should work together. I also want to just say that um, I believe we all need to work together on behalf of the health and education and well-being of our children. And we all need to create a new ethic in this state and in this country that says we're on their team, we're on their side, we're, we're paying attention to where they're going. But we also want them to know that they must have high levels of achievement. In many countries in Europe, when a child reaches a certain age, typically in what we consider middle school, they go and visit businesses and companies and hospitals and places where work is done. So one of the things we can do is arrange more field trips where kids can come to the city hall and see what we do there, see what the police do. I know there's limitations and they can't go on ride-alongs, but, but they can, in fact, see what the firefighters and the police officers do and what their work is. Because it's important work, and in fact, a good many of them may find it their work. The reality is that we also need to do things like community gardens and school gardens. The truth is that during the Second World War, 42% of the produce consumed in this country was grown in homes. It was the Second World War, and people decided they needed to free up more resources for the war effort. But it also is a wonderful way for kids to learn all kinds of things. First, it's really good exercise. And second, it is children that don't think they like vegetables will eat vegetables they have grown. I'm just sorry, they do it all the time. I've been in inner city schools where the kids told me. One, one fabulous school I went to was behind Just Desserts in San Francisco. Sheriff Hennessy of the, of the San Francisco Sheriff's Department had set this up with Alice Waters at Chez Panisse. These kids are incarcerated youth. They're out gardening, okay? And this young boy takes me on, a, he's 15, he's in jail for mugging an elderly woman for her purse. And he takes me through the garden and he said, I gotta confess to you that I never liked vegetables, you know, I mean, my mom, she served salad, but it tasted like the refrigerator. Oh, she cut off the brown spots, but it tasted like the refrigerator. And then he leans over and says, but this arugula, this is good stuff. <laughs> I've seen inner city kids and poor kids eating, tell me, uh, singing the glories of fava beans and things they had never eaten before in their lives because they had grown them themselves. And that's something we can do. Every, every city's got some places that were a few weeds in them last time I looked. And so, in fact, what about if we did more community gardens and engaged more of our kids in, on the weekends, in summer schools, and in other, other places? I will just say that. Um, there's a lot of research about what I'm talking about. Research about preschool and about child development. Research about the importance of education. Research about the importance of community engagement and civic engagement. Research about how gardens improve and help kids to nurture and grow things. I really do believe America does an amazing job of research. When I was in France visiting the French preschools, 
not on your tax dollars, but as a guest of the French American Foundation, because I'd had a universal preschool task force. This woman I was, who was wonderful and was giving us this great tour, I said, so tell me, what does your research show? You've had preschools now for parts of France. They've been around for 100 years, but it, since most of France has had it since the end of the Second World War, and I said, so what does your research show? And she kind of was typical French style, you know, kind of a... <laughs> well, as a matter of fact, we did not have as good of the research institutions as you in America. So we use your research mostly <laughs> um, because we've done the research. The National Research Council has a whole study called From Neurons to Neighborhoods, from the scientist in the crib. You know, the truth is there's a ton of literature about the importance of preschool, about the importance of civic engagement for kids, about what happens when you get a community involved with the schools and the schools involved with the community, about what happens when kids feel a sense of, a sense of commitment to their town. You know, gangs go down, vandalism goes down, the, the real challenges associated with bad behavior go down, and the community becomes a healthier, safer place to be. I will say that we didn't have research when Lincoln did an amazing thing in 1862 in the very depths of the Civil War when it didn't appear that he would win. He started dreaming about every state having a land grant college. And he signed a bill called the Morrill Act. And he didn't leave, live to see it really enacted. But if you go and look online and look at it, he dreams that, that all kinds of people will get to go to college. Today there are 181 colleges in the United States that are from, because of Lincoln, that are land grant colleges they're called. And you know some of them as Cornell and Duke and Iowa State. You know some as Florida A&M and Texas A&M. You know some as the University of California at Berkeley, University of California at Davis, University of California at Riverside. Lincoln didn't have any research, but he had courage, vision, and heart. During the Second World War, the dark days of 1944, Franklin Roosevelt did an amazing thing. He said, we ought to make it possible for our GIs to go to college. Some people made fun of him, it's true, but in the end, the GI Bill tripled the number of people who attended colleges in the United States. In 1946, Harry Truman signed the National School Lunch Act. He didn't have a lot of research on this, but he had common sense and courage and vision and heart, and he decided we should have a school lunch program because the draft in 46 turned away a record number of young men. They were typically 19 and much to a much greater extent than 41 to 45, they had crooked spines and foreshortened limbs and bad eyesight and bad teeth. These were the children of the Great Depression. So if you read the National School Lunch Act, it says the health of our nation's children being a matter of national security, the Congress does ordain and establish the School Lunch Act. In 57, Sputnik went up. Eisenhower could have easily said, my God, we've got a Cold War and a hot war potential. But we've certainly got a Cold War, and now we've got a space race? We can't be thinking about education. Instead, he did an amazing thing. He signed the biggest college student loan act in history. He wanted more scientists, engineers, and teachers. He called it the National Defense Education Act. I'm here today talking about the defense of this community, but also the glory of this community. The glory of what you can do if you decide to put your shoulder to the wheel and get behind your children. John Kennedy in 1960 challenged us, early 60s, challenged us to put a man on the moon by the end of the decade. Of course, we did that, but at the time, some of you are too young, you weren't even born yet, but at the time, he was made fun of. They said it was too expensive, it was too difficult, too big a challenge, it was too hard. Kennedy said, we go to the moon, not because it is easy, but because it is hard. Some of your educators won't want to necessarily work with cities. Some of our city staff may not be in their comfort zone trying to figure out how to help the kids. There may be some other people out there that say, that's not our job. But the truth is, I guess I believe that it's everybody's job to fight for what's right and to teach our kids that we believe in them and help them to believe in themselves. Bill Moyers recently reminded us, quote, for all the rhetoric about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, it took a civil war to free the slaves and another hundred years to invest their freedom with meaning. Women only gained the right to vote in my mother's time. New ages don't arrive overnight.
But there could be a new age in this community. There could be a new age in San Lorenzo and San Leandro. It could be a beacon for the rest of this county, and it could help all of California to be a better place. Again, there'll be those who say, well, this isn't, we don't need to do this. This is outside of our comfort zone. I salute all of you for being here today. I salute all the public officials and the leaders of the districts who are here believing that this can, in fact, be done. Susan B. Anthony once observed, cautious, careful people always casting about to preserve their reputation and social standing can never bring about a reform, end quote. You're not, I'm not urging you to be reckless, but I am not, I am urging you not to be cautious and careful in that old-fashioned sense, but to be bold and to be daring and to dream great dreams for the children of this area and for other children as well. I will say that um, at the end of the day, we have also a challenge to make sure the people who lead on our behalf in Sacramento do things that support what you're doing. So I would urge you as this goes forward to make sure that you, know, you inform your assembly member and your senator and their staffs about what you're doing, about what we can do. The fact is that we also need to make sure they understand that spending $51,000 a prisoner or $225,000 per student in California Youth Authority isn't the really best investment they could be making of our resources. They need to invest here in this community, in the cities and in the schools, on behalf of the children. As you do this, please remember, when you look in the eyes of the child, you often think you see the face of hope. I used to think that, but now I realize it's something more. It's the face of optimism. You hope with your fingers crossed. But optimism is that sense of the possible. Optimism is a kid running to the library or to the playground or to participate in a community recreation program or running to the computer lab. And I believe that optimism is also a homeless girl that I met in San Diego at a school for homeless children who told me, looked me right in the eye when I asked her what she wanted to be. She said she wanted to be a marine biologist. Out there are some kids in blue collar families or children in single parent homes, even some kids in foster care and group homes who you may not think have great futures. Because of what you could start this morning, they could indeed have great, great futures. Martin Seligman wrote a wonderful book called Learned Optimism, and he writes in it that uh, a lot of the traditional, let me see, here, here it is, the traditional view of achievement, like the traditional view of depression, needs overhaul. Our workplaces and our schools operate on the conventional assumption that success results from a combination of talent and desire. When failure occurs, it is either because talent or desire is missing. But failure can also occur when talent and desire are present in abundance, but optimism is missing. Go forward this morning with optimism about what you can be, achieve on behalf of a bunch of little kids who really need your help and your optimism. I think by your presence here this morning, you are optimists, and I hope that in fact, you have a fabulous meeting and that wonderful things happen. I'll look forward to checking in. I thank you from my heart for taking the time to do this work.